first, uh, as always, community group every Friday, 7.30, okay? If you guys haven't been, come out. It's a really good time. We're actually going through a great series. It's called uh, Reason for God. I, we're just going through a series basically explaining ways in which we can communicate our faith, addressing our doubts, and really being able to uh, talk about God in a way that's, that's articulate and yet at the same time uh, passionate and, 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 and doesn't sound like we're crazy, okay? So come out to community group. Uh, Friday at 7.30. We'd love to see you guys. And then uh, second Saturday every month, women's, men's and women's group. We just had our, our first, our second men's and women's group yesterday. It was really good. Uh, a lot of brothers came to my house. Sisters came over to um, High and um, uh, Grace's house. So it's a great time. If you guys are uh, thinking about, you know, wanting to be part of just a community where people are keeping each other accountable, come out to uh, men's and women's group. Okay? It's open to everybody. Okay? And... Membership class next week. Yes, membership class next week. If you have not signed the membership covenant, okay, or if you are deciding and thinking about whether I want to be a member of TLC or not, I encourage you, highly encourage you to come out to membership class October 19th. It's an hour class, but basically it talks about everything that we do, everything that we believe in, and we give you the chance to really either say, you know, I want to be a part of that, or uh, I'm waiting for a little bit. So it gives us the right to really speak truth into your life and, um, have authority to to do so okay so come out to membership class we'd love to see you okay and then family camp uh family camp forms evan has the forms um please come to evan get the forms and fill them out because we need to turn those things in as quickly as possible so that we can create uh the groups and have a list of people going as as fast as they can so they can get the food ready and they can get the the bunks and the beds and all that stuff uh set up for all of us so uh, if you're thinking about coming to family camp, which I hope all of you guys are, uh, November 28th to 30th, Friday to Sunday, okay, at Irvine Park. It'll be great. And then uh, lastly, Praise Team is looking, or not lastly, Praise Team is looking for worship people, okay? Again, if you are sitting here, you're doing nothing, and you realize, I want to serve somewhere in what capacity, and you know that you can play an instrument, hey, Praise Team has a spot for you, okay? Look at Ray. Doesn't he look lonely up there? Come on, right? You guys... Come and bless the brother. Encourage him. Uh, be back up. Help him sing. Help him play some songs, okay? So we love to have you guys there. And last announcement is winter retreat. January 16th and 19th, we already got our speaker. He's a great guy. I love him to death. A uh, good friend of mine. So come out to there. January 16th and 19th, book it. Uh, we're, still, we're still looking for a spot, but hopefully it will be a good spot, okay? So uh, January 16th to 19th, I promise there will be bathrooms, okay? So January 16th to 19th. It's Friday to, I think, Monday. Uh, Martin Luther King's birthday. All right? Very cool. All right. Then um, let's bow our heads and let's get started. Let's bow our heads and get started today. Okay. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for uh, this time here at this church. Father, here, here with your people. Gather, Lord, to listen to your word. Gather, Father God, to hear what you have to say. Father, I pray for our hearts to be still and our minds to be open. I pray, God, that you would just soften us so that your Holy Spirit can come and speak the truth and convict our hearts and really pierce us, Father, with your double-edged sword of reality. And I pray, God, that as we read through these letters of Revelation, Dad, that it would really remind us that these letters are to us and to our lives and to our hearts as well. And so, Father, I pray that you would give us wisdom and clarity um, to hear the words and pray, Father God, for myself, that you would give me strength to preach it faithfully um, and worthy as I am to do so. And God, I pray for this uh, afternoon. May it be a blessing to you. May you be honored. And Lord, may your work be done. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you guys. Um, I have a good word from you. From God. Every day, is, every Sunday is a good word, but um, this word is good. It's a little hard. But it's a good word. But basically what we're going through today, uh, what we've been going through is the book of Revelation. It's a quick survey of the first few chapters of Revelation. And it's basically the letters of Jesus writing to his seven churches, right? He loves his church. They are in the midst of, he, he senses within them a, a partial love to him. And because and that partial love is, is, is given because of fear, of doubts, of struggles, right? And so he writes this letter, and he tells John, send this to the seven churches. Tell them who I am. Tell them that I see them. Tell them that I know their hearts. 
Tell them that I'm watching over them. Tell them that I love them. And even more, remind them. Remind them of who they follow. This, these letters to the seven churches, ultimately then, is the letters to us. Right? It's a letter to God speaking to us with this huge enveloping question, which is this, do you love me? The seven, the seven letters to the seven churches is ultimately a letter to you with one question that God is asking. Do you love me? Do you love me enough, Ephesus, that you will forsake all other loves, that you will put aside everything that you hold so dearly and make me the center of your love, your first love? Do you love me deep enough, Smyrna, that you would do radical things for me, things that would cause suffering, things that would bring you pain, but things that are radical? Do you love me enough? Do you love me, Church of Pergamum, that you will listen to my truth and obey it, that my truth will ring deep into your soul? Do you love me, Church of Pergamum? Eventually, today, as we look into the Church of Thyatira, it's the same question, do you love me? But the question that he asked the church is this, do you love me enough not to compromise for your own personal gain? Not to compromise me for your personal gain? Not to compromise your faith for your own personal upward mobility, right? Thyatira, it's a great city. It's a, it's a smaller city than all the other cities. But uh, one special trait about this city, it was, it, was, it was known for their trade guilds. Those of you guys who play a lot of video games, you guys know what guilds are, right? Um, I still have a really hard time understanding guilds, but it's like, it's like a fraternity or a group of same like-minded people. Like there's like a iron guild. There's like a... Uh, blacksmith guild, there's leather tanner guild, there's, there's guilds for a specific profession. It's kind of like a union kind of deal, right? They were known for their unions, and they, they were, it's very deeply rooted in the city, okay, in Thyatira. And because of that, because of that, Christians in the city, they had a struggle, right? Christians in, in general usually have struggles. Our biggest, our biggest struggle in life, or our biggest um, way in which we live in the city is this. We're attractive and we're repellent at the same time, right? We're attractive in a way where people, when they see us, when they see the believers in Thyatira, they see the kindness, they see the generosity, they see the perseverance. There's something about the Christian power that's living inside them that's causing this huge attractiveness from people around them. They love that. They love the fact that you can stand in the midst of suffering and have a peace about you. They love the fact that there's a generosity that expands not just to the people you love, but even to your enemies and to those you don't even know. They love the fact there is a kindness about you to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. So the people were attracted to that, but they also were repellent, right? They, 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 Christians repelled people in power because people in power says, this is what you have to do in order for you to be accepted. This is what you have to believe and tolerate in order for you to be accepted into our city, into our guild, into our union, into our place of work. This is what you have to hold on to. And Christians were like, no, we're not going to worship other gods. We're not going to sacrifice. We're not going to do that. Right? And so because of that, there's always that attractive and repelling aspect of the Christian life. You see, again, for you as a Christian, if you are living a life constantly repelling people, it's mostly probably because you're using your faith as a burden to people. You're being overbearing. And people, instead of being attracted to your God, to your Jesus, they are actually repelled by him. But at the same time, if you're being a living life so, so attractive, so attractive, probably because you're living your life cowardly before God. That you're, not, you're afraid to stand up for his truth. You're afraid to put him as center of your love, and you're afraid to do radical things for him. And so everything you do becomes very tolerable to other people. Right? See, the church of Thyatira, they were very attractive. People saw their love, they saw their perseverance, they saw their, their, their generosity, and they were very attracted to them. But the problem with the church of Thyatira was this. They didn't repel. They didn't repel people. They were tolerable to a lot of the situations that were going on. They were tolerable, and they compromised their faith in great ways. And Jesus writes this letter to them to remind them, I see, and he he shows himself with great power, with blazing eyes, with red eyes. I see through into your heart. 
Remember who it is that you worship. I am not some dude that grew up in Galilee, right? Some simple guy, some simple fisherman. I am the king of the world. I am the God of the universe. He describes himself with piercing eyes, seeing to the heart of people, bronze feet with power and stance. He is describing himself with great power, reminding them that you serve an unbelievable God. So do not compromise. So we're going to learn a couple of things about compromise today. We're going to learn the problem of compromise. We're going to learn the danger behind compromise. We're going to learn the solution to compromise, right? The problem of compromise, the danger of compromise, and the solution to compromise. So open your Bibles to uh, Revelation chapter 2. We're looking at verse 18 to verse 29. If you have your green Bibles that's in your pews, it's on page 863, I believe, of your Bible. Verse 18 to 29. Okay, open your Bibles up. Revelation 2, 18 to 29. And so you're going to hear as we read um, Jesus commending them, and then again he rebukes them. Okay, listen now. Verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. I see you. You're living your life with generosity and kindness. It is being, is, you're drawing people. But verse 20, it says this, Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual morality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead, then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches hearts and minds. And I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, for to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who has an ear, let him hear. Right? So at verse 20, what is the problem of compromise? This is, this is their issue. The issue for the church of Thyatira was this. They compromised for the sake of upward mobility. They compromised for the sake of upward mobility. There were so many guilds in Thyatira. To belong to a guild was to belong to a fraternity of people. To belong to this fraternity of people means you ought to do what they do in order to be accepted by them. You ought to tolerate what they do because if you do not tolerate what they do, you will be isolated from this group. You will be pushed aside from this group. You will risk your business, your work. You will risk clients because no one will send clients to you anymore. Right? Because you are being intolerable. The problem in the church of Thyatira was this. They were compromising. And so for, almost, for a lot of us, we, we, we think the word compromise, we're like, what's, what's, what's the big deal? Because when you begin to compromise, what happens? You rationalize. You make excuses for it. What's the big deal of just lying a little bit on my taxes? What's the big deal of... Um, of of looking at this while I'm married? Or what's the big deal of, you know, flirting with other people while I'm in a relationship? What's the big deal of doing those tiny little things, right? I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not causing any harm. What's the big deal of doing these small things? And so Jesus, in a way of explaining how big this deal is, he uses the story of Jezebel. You guys know Jezebel? Don't name your daughters Jezebel, okay? Just for your information. Jezebel the moment he mentioned the name Jezebel, okay, it rung a clue into the minds of the Jewish people. The story of Jezebel. Everybody knows Jezebel. Right? We don't know Jezebel because we don't read our Old Testament very much, right? But everybody back then knew Jezebel, okay? There was someone in this church acting just like Jezebel, making small compromises to God's people, 
hey, just, just do this on the weekends or on the weekdays. Monday, on Sundays, on Fridays, go to church, do your Bible studies. But on the weekdays, come out to the party. Sacri- eat the food sacrificed to the idols. You know what? It's not a big deal. Everyone's doing it in town. Everyone, if you want to be a part of the guild, if you want to be part of your work, if you don't want to get isolated, be a part of this. Listen to what I have to tell you, right? It's not a big deal. And you rationalize it because as Christians, they say, oh, yeah, it can't be a big deal. I still go to church on Sundays. I still do my things on Friday. But Jesus says, let me tell the story of Jezebel. Remember her? Everyone was like, oh, yeah, I remember her. To us, we're like, no, remind me, Tony, okay? So here's the story of Jezebel. In the book of Kings, there were these, after Solomon, there were a divided kingdom, right? And there were kings out of both kingdoms of Israel. And one of the rules of God's people was this, do not marry outside of your race. Not because God was racist, but because he understood that when you marry someone outside, you, you be like Solomon. You, you bring your wives and gods into your family, into your house, and it causes confusion and it causes um, disillusionment among your people. There was a king, King Ahab, for the sake of upward mobility, for the sake of creating alliances with the surrounding kingdom, he thought to himself, what's the best way to increase my political power? I should marry one of my uh, foes' daughters. I should marry the neighboring uh, kingdom's daughter. If I marry them, then we have an alliance, then my political strength and power increases. And so he marries who? Jezebel. Jezebel, very sweet girl, woman, right? Princess. Um, She comes in. Honeymoon was great. But then after the honeymoon, she brings in all of her priests, the priests of Baal. She brings almost 130 or 50 of them into Israel. And at first, King Ahab was like, what can 150 priests do? We have plenty of priests, right? It's not going to be a big deal. I'm still going to worship my God at the temple. You know, the priests will still do their thing. It's going to be fine. Bring her priests in. Let her do whatever she wants, right? Jezebel's compromise, Abra- I mean, Ahab's small compromise with Jezebel began the spiral of Israel's people so deep that it destroyed that generation, generations to come, and it caused God to kick everyone out of the land. Completely say, you have to get out of this land. It destroyed God's people over a small compromise. Jezebel came in with 100 priests, and over time, day by day, weeks by weeks, months by months, she infiltrated into the very heart of worship. You know, first day it was just priests came down and sat with the people. They began to speak. They began to teach. And all of a sudden, the people were beginning to worship Baal. Small compromises end up becoming a huge burden upon God's people, leading them astray, tearing them away from God. What was the problem in this church? Okay. For the sake of upward mobility, for the sake of making life better for yourself, for the sake of keeping your job, for the sake of getting people to tolerate you, The Christians in the church of Thyatira chose to compromise. They chose to allow Jezebel, which is another person in the church, preaching her thing, killing the people, poisoning them from the inside out. You see, a lot of us, we think the word tolerant, um, intolerant, we think the word intolerant as evil. Because we grew up in this modern culture, that we have to be tolerant of everybody. Right? You guys, you, guys, you guys get that feeling sometimes? Because if te- someone tells you to, that you're, if you're, in order to, for you to be accepting or loving, you must tolerate everyone else's teaching. You must tolerate what people believe in. You must tolerate them for who they are. Tolerance is not always a good thing, right? You guys know that. Tolerance is not always a good thing. But our modern culture has taught us that you have to be tolerant if you're going to be someone acceptable. Church of Thyatira, Christians felt like they had to be tolerant if they were going to be accepted into the culture. And that's the biggest problem. You're not going to be intolerant. You can't be tolerant all the time, right? Let's say some kid came up to you and disrespects you, right? So one of our kids came up and disrespects you. You're not going to be tolerant of that, right? I hope not. You're going to be like, shut your mouth, right? You're not going to be tolerant of their actions. You can't be tolerant of disrespect, right? Intolerance sometimes is a good thing. Sometimes when you're a doctor, if you're a doctor, if you get really sick and you go to a doctor and you say, I have a, I have a, 
I have medicine for your sickness. You're not going to tolerate your, your pain and your, your sickness. You're going to allow, you're going to be intolerant of it. Intolerance sometimes is a good thing. It's a good thing sometimes, right? You're not going to tolerate things. And, and so our modern culture has taught us this. The big problem of our culture has taught us that you have to be tolerant if you want to be loving. Our culture has taught us that if you are not a tolerant person, then you are not a loving person. But you have to accept everybody or else you're not loving. See, they hate the fact that Christianity is exclusive. They hate the fact that Christianity is so exclusive. Why can't we all just get along? Why can't the church of Thyatira hang out with the priestess and the prophetess and still worship God? Why do we have to kind of separate everything? Everything should be acceptable. You know what problem that is, right? When people say that, they sound very inclusive. They sound like very loving. But the reality is they're very exclusive. That's a very exclusive statement. Right? Everybody is exclusive. Yes, yes, you guys have to understand that. Every teaching about spiritual reality is exclusive. Right? What those guys are saying is this. My view of spiritual reality, meaning that everyone should be accepted, should be the most important view. It should be the accepted view among everybody else. That's the right view. Your view that Christianity is exclusive and that you cannot tolerate any other faith, that view is unacceptable. You should accept my view. See, see, it's still very exclusive. So everyone's exclusive. The real big question is this. Whose exclusiveness can actually bring life? Whose exclusive teaching can actually give life? The church in Thyatira, this is why Jesus spoke to them. They were trying to be modern. The Christians were being modern. They were like, it's okay if I hang out at this party on Monday, Tuesday. I still go to church on Sunday. It's all right if I do this on Wednesday, Thursday. If on Friday, I still go to community group. They were trying to be very tolerant, and they compromised their faith. And the problem with that, what Jesus was trying to say is this. I know your heart, and I am the one with power. Listen to me. This will only bring death. Okay? So the problem is what? They compromise for upward motility. How many guys... We end up doing that. We compromise for the sake of moving upward in our life. Right? We, comp- we make small, rational reasoning. Every reasoning that we make for our compromise is a good reason. It's never a bad reason. But we do it to move up. So the question, the second question is this. What's the danger of it then? What's the da- Tony, what's the danger of that? How bad can a little bit of compromise here and there do? Honestly, how bad can it do? What, what huge effect can possibly happen if I compromise like this. Look at what happens to this church. There's three types of people that is addressed here, okay? Verse 21 and 23, okay? I have given her time to repent of her immorality. This is talking to the person who is causing the trouble in the church, but she is unwilling. I will cast her on her bed of suffering. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. There are three types of people going on in this church. There are those who are strong to God's word, who are un- unfazed in it, holding on to God's truth. There are those who are what? Being modern. There are those who are starting to compromise. There are those who are saying this. It's all right. It's not a big deal. What's so bad about eating at an idol's feast? It's going to help me with my business. It's going to help me with my clients. I should do this. It's not a big deal. What's so bad about cheating a little bit on my taxes, a little bit fibbing here, a little bit fibbing there? What's so bad about that? What's so bad about flirting with so-and-so even though I'm married? What's so bad about that? What's so bad, right? Those are the modern type. And eventually what happened? They went from strong believing to a little bit of compromise, eventually to who? Children. Of this woman. Children of the woman is a metaphoric term saying that what? These guys have basically given up on the Lord. They have rejected God totally, and now they are following after this woman's teaching. They are following fully after a woman's teaching that's leading them towards death. What is so bad about compromise? Because when you compromise, you're thinking it's not a big issue, but you develop within your heart this habit of a constant spiraling down. You don't see it at first. You never see it at first, but you develop in your heart as you begin to rationalize your compromise. 
if you, as you begin to tolerate things, you, you allow yourself to have this habit of spiraling down. Let me give you some example, okay? First, I'll give you an example of the story of Jezebel. Jezebel came in. King Ahab was like, it's fine. It's not a big deal, right? Over time, what happened? King Ahab began to worship Baal. So the king was supposed to be the spiritual leader of the kingdom. So he failed. And then over time, what happened? The priest was supposed to come in and write the king. But over time, as compromises and toleration begins to continue, the priest began to worship Baal. And as the priest began to worship Baal, what happened to the people? The people fell along as well. The people began to worship Baal. Do you know what God had to do to that situation? He had to go in there and he sent his third his third position, the one that writes everything when both of them goes wrong, he sends in his prophet, Elijah. And the story of Elijah is a beautiful story. He comes in and he writes it all. By how? He got rid of them completely. He wiped them all out. Right? You see, when you begin to compromise, it doesn't seem so bad at first. But as you begin to tolerate it, you spiral down. Let me give you some more examples. Five examples. I have a bud. When you were in um, high school, some of you guys are still in high uh, we up in high school here. We took U.S. History AP. You guys all took U.S. History AP? You guys remember that? You had to outline every chapter. You guys hate doing that, didn't you? I hate outlining every U.S. History chapter. So it took a lot of work. It took a lot of time because each chapter was like 30, 40 pages, having to outline all of it. And our teacher wanted it to be very detailed, right? So I did most of my, I did all my work, right? There were guys at my, uh, going to school with me who got kind of lazy and, you know, some of them were Christians too, which is kind of weird, right? They, they got kind of lazy and they said, you know what, Tony? Teacher doesn't really check it. He doesn't. He just stamps it. Just print it out for us, right? I wasn't a believer back then. I said, all right, print it out for us. Print out like five copies. So I did. I printed out five copies, gave each one of them copies, and they just turned it in. No one knew the better of it. We all got stamped, right? Homework done. Not a big deal, right? What's a big deal? Teacher doesn't look. No one deals with it. Not a big deal, right? But that habit began to kind of just continue throughout high school. Same five guys continue with that huge habit of just constantly plagiarizing, constantly cheating, trying to get their way so they can get the A without having to do the work, right? Same five guys or same guys got into UCLA, okay? Who knows how they got into UCLA? And I didn't. I'm still bitter, but that's all right, right? Got into UCLA, right? Within two years, they got first AP academic foundation for plagiarizing, Right? Once they got AP, then they got kicked out because they did it again. They did it again for the sake of getting the A, for the sake. They thought they were smooth about it. They thought the first time they cheated, they didn't cover all their bases. The second time they did it, they thought they covered all their bases, but their teacher was even smarter than them. Right? Caught them for the second time, kicked them out of school, UCLA. See, when you begin the habit of compromise and tolerating, you know what happens? You begin to spiral out of control. You don't see it at first. Everything becomes rationalized at first. Not a big deal, you tell yourself. Not a huge issue. What's the harm? I'm not going to turn into a bad person, right? What's a little plagiarizing here and there? What's the problem of just copying here and there? Okay? I had a buddy also. Um, he, you know how work is hard to get nowadays, right? Work is hard to get. If y'all haven't got, if y'all's got a job, work is a blessing. Love your job, right? Those of you guys who are still looking for jobs, now I feel your pain, right? I had a brother uh, back in the days, he had a hard time looking for a job, like really hard. So difficult that his, like, he was, he was trying to get married. His, his, um, his in-laws, his fiance's uh, parents were, like, giving him such grief about it because he couldn't get a job. He's graduated. He has his degree. He has, he's smart enough, but for some reason, nobody was hiring. So he was really desperate to keep a, to have a job and to keep a job. Right, he was doing, like, random stuff, working at, like, Starbucks, working at Blockbuster, just, just trying to get ends meet so that he can, like, kind of pay the bills for a while, trying to find a career. Finally, he got a job. He got a job. It was a really cool job, too. Works with his major, pays well, great career, and even better, the group of people that he worked with was kind of like a fraternity of brothers, right? These guys, these project groups, they're like, almost like a guild, right? Fraternity of brothers did everything together. Really extroverted, and he's a very extroverted guy too. So he he loved that. He loved hanging out and being part of them. Only issue was this: they had one thing that they do every every time during lunchtime. For lunch, down the street was a strip club. Every lunch, the majority of them, even their project managers, would go into a strip club, have lunch, and do their thing down there. And for months, they asked my friend to go. 
months, after, days after days, weeks after weeks, they asked my buddy to go. He's about to get married. Okay, he's about to get married. He's thinking about his marriage, and they're asking him, go. Come with us. It's not a big deal, right? And you know, every time we have Bible study, and he talks about it, and he shares about it, this is what he always says to me. He says, every time they ask, you know, these are brothers. We, we feel like we're a family of workers together, great guys. And I also feel like I want to keep my job. And so my project manager goes, and the fact that I'm, I keep saying no makes me feel like he's going to keep, like, projects for me or keep me from actually being able to get my raises and stuff. So I get kind of nervous, you know? And even more... I'm starting to rationalize, Tony. I'm starting to say stuff like, I'll just go and sit at the bar. I'll just have a drink. I'll just eat a sandwich. They can do what they want, and then we'll leave afterwards. At least I'll be there. And so I, I started to rationalize that. And it makes sense to me, you know, that it's, it's doable, you know. But he never did it. He never did it, okay. So much so, these guys, they kept coming to him. And there was even one time, there was one time where, one of the guys, one of his buddies came up and said, hey, look, man, so-and-so, he was just like you. Christian guy, loves the Lord. He still loves God, man, but he's just go, he goes there, it's fine, right? Just go hang out the bar with them, it'll be great. And so when my friend heard that, he's like, huh, tempting, right? Another brother going, tempting, right? It's like the guy's married too, you know, everything. And my, his friends were like kind of work him up with this, it. like it's fine, not a big deal. Just come out, have lunch with us. But my friend said again, oh, my God, if you, he loves his wife. He loves his future wife. He wanted to keep himself right with her, not doing anything that stupid. So he says, I'm not going to go, right? And because he said that, yes, he, he, he got passed up a couple promotions. A couple projects were not given to him, right? I mean, of course, he still hung out with them and still buddy buddies, but they kind of pushed him aside because they felt like he was the outlier. He was the, he was the guy on the side, right? But he told me a couple years afterwards, he said, I'm really glad I never went. I said, Why? So you know that very same guy that they were trying to compare me to, that, that Christian guy who came to have a drink only and have lunch only? You know, that same guy I found out ended up um, cheating on his wife and ended up getting a divorce a couple of years later, you know? It's crazy. No one ever gets into stuff like that and says, oh, I'm going to leave my wife. I'm going to go to strip club and I'm going to leave my wife. No one ever thinks about stuff like that. But you know what the, the danger of compromise is? But the danger of allowing something like that to enter into your life, it leads you down roads. One compromise leads to another compromise, leads to another compromise, leads to another compromise. I see this in relationships all the time. When people come to me and talk to me about relationships, I see it all the time in relationships. Compromise after compromise. I say, are you sure you want to date that guy? Are you sure you want to date that girl? I say, yeah, you know, you know they, they aren't believers. It's going to be very difficult. And sometimes I get this, I like, Tony, I got this. Look who you're talking to. I got this, right? Look at me. I'm a godly man. You know I am, right? Or look, Tony, you know me. I'm innocent. I'm, I'll never do anything that stupid. So compromise leads to compromise. They always do. One compromise always leads to a second compromise, right? And eventually what happens? Relationships hurled out of control, gets in trouble, and then they, and I asked them, what happened to, hey, I am man, hear me roar. What happened to that, right? What happened to the, 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 I got this part? What happened to that? And they'll say, but you don't understand, Tony, man, things happen. Of course things happen. That's the whole point. That's the problem when you begin to compromise. Things happen. That's the danger of it. You spiral out of control. But it's never a day. It's always weeks and months. And years. It takes time to build that. It takes time to hurt that. Some of us, we think about like, you know, um, Pastor Tony, I have, I have things I got to do, so I can't go to church on Sunday this week. Fine, that's fine, right? Or Pastor Tony, you know, I have, I have a couple projects that I got to deal with. I can't show up to church this whole month. Okay. You know, Pastor Tony, I'm, I'm dealing with my internship that's going to take up the whole summer, so I'll see you in the fall. Okay. Or Pastor Tony, really, I, I can only show up to Christmas and Easter now. Okay. Right? Compromise leads to compromise leads to compromise. And eventually, we walk down the road where we become children of the prophetess. Right? What happened here? We see godly individuals in the church. People who hold fast to God's truth. People who are living in perseverance. And we see a few of them beginning the process of compromise. It's not a big deal. 
I still go to Sunday service. I still go to community group. I still do my thing. I'm just doing this on Monday, Tuesday. I'm just having dinner at this feast. I need to be there if I want to have my business go well. I want to be there if I want to actually move up. I want to be there. I got to be there if I want to be accepted by this guild. From there, what happened? Move towards children. Children who has totally abandoned their God. Children who has walked away from their faith. Children who has totally turned around and walked towards death. Do you know why Jesus is speaking to them this way? It's not because he's asking, look, look, look in the midst of how he says it, it seems very evil that he wants them to suffer. But remember what we talk about with suffering. Look at verse 22. He says, I will cast her on her bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely. So I will make those who are in this process of, in this compromising process, also suffer. Right? You guys ever realize when you begin to like kind of backslide with God a little bit, something really dramatic sometimes happens to your life? Like you get really sick out out of the blue, like you're bedridden, or you get into a huge accident, right? Or something just really happens, and it just shocks you for a second, right? And it feels like you're suffering, you're in pain. You know why is that that happens? Because suffering allows for you to stop and think about the road you're going down so that you can repent and go back the other way. Suffering allows for you to stop for a second to go down, to, to think about the road and the choices you're making, the compromises you're making, so that you can stop and repent and go back the other way. Because if you do not, if you do not end up repenting, you walk down the road of death. This is what Jesus says when he says, I will kill her children. It's not the fact that he's going to strike and kill babies, right? If he's saying this, those who are going to give their life to her teaching, to this God, to Baal, to the worship, to the feast, to the sexual morality, those who are going to give their life to these gods, they will die. That's why I'm angry. That's why God is mad. That's why he speaks with such anger. They're dying, and they don't even know it. And those who have given themselves fully, they're dead. Remember I told you? Every idol that you worship, whether it be money, relationship, family, education, upward mobility, every idol and God that you worship, it demands that you die in order to keep it. Right? Only Jesus says, I will die in order to keep you. Think about it. If, you, if, you, if money is the thing that you were craving and wanting for, what happens when you have it? Aren't you happy? Aren't you thrilled? But what happens when you lose it? Aren't you anxious? Aren't you depressed? Don't you get angry? Do you know why? It's you do anything possible. You give everything possible in order to have it. You're actually, it demands that you're dying for it. Think about relationships. When you're in a good relationship and your boyfriend and your girlfriend is with you, you, don't you feel like lovey-dovey and everything's great? What happens when things go bad? What happens when arguments begin to happen? What happens when there is uh, irreconcilable differences? What happens when there is so much animosity? What happens when there's breakups? Aren't you hurt? Don't you feel Don't you feel like your life is over? If you have made that your idol and that's your whole entire life, do you know what happens? Jesus is saying, you're dying. You're dying. You're dying. What is the danger, you guys, of compromise in the Christian walk? What is the danger of compromise in the Christian church? You begin to rationalize and you don't realize that you're digging yourself into a hole that you can't get out of. You dig and you dig and you dig and you dig. And before long, you realize this hole is so deep. It all starts with just a little bit. It's not bad. It's not a big deal. Just a small little compromise. What's so bad? It doesn't hurt anybody. It doesn't do any harm. You ever hear the phrase, the road to hell is paved by good intentions? Right? No one ever thinks to do bad. They always have good intentions. I, I, I wanted it to be good. I wanted things to be good. But eventually, you're just walking towards death. And Jesus hurts when he sees his church like that. He hurts when he sees you like that. He sees his sons, he sees his daughters spiraling out of control, spiraling towards towards Satan's call and Satan's voice. And he says, stop. 
listen. Do not compromise. Don't tolerate. It's okay to be intolerant in certain areas. Stand firm. I see through to your heart. You're telling me it's not a big deal, but I see your heart. And you're being dragged there. You're being pulled there. Listen to me. Right? The problem that church faith and that Jesus is telling us is this. You compromise for upward mobility. You compromise to get what you want. The danger of that is you actually spiral out of control while you do it. And you're walking towards death as you do it. Right? So what's the solution? What's the solution here? Look at verse 24. 22. Right? 22, he says a couple of times. He says this twice. He says first to her and he says it to her children or to those who are committing adultery with her. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering. I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. Unless they repent. As we are in this realm of compromise, you know what God calls us to do? Repent. To stop. He brings into our lives huge suffering or even huge pain sometimes so that it will shock us keeps us still for us to realize where we're going and begin to repent. How do you continue to grow in your Christian life? The same way you enter your Christian life. You repent. And you cling on to the one who gives life. You cling to the one who gives life. Repentance is that. It is you are holding on tightly to the one who is life, Jesus Christ. And no matter what people say, you will not let go. Even if you would die, you will not let go. You will turn from your, whatever direction you're going, and you will turn back to him. That is repentance. Don't come to a place in your life where you've entered into indifference. You know what indifference is? I said it last week. Indifference is the opposite of love. When you come to a place where you have loved God, and now you've come indifference with God, that you don't even care anymore. You're in a place right now, but maybe that you are compromising. Maybe you are compromising in your in your work life. Maybe you are compromising in your relationship life. Maybe you're compromising in your, in your family life. Maybe you're compromising in your marriage. In your single. Maybe you're compromising in a lot of ways. God is saying, before you get to the place where you're spouse so deeply, where you have become indifference to my voice and you can't even hear it anymore, let me tell you something. Repent. 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 Repentance is basically saying, God, what else am I supposed to do? To whom shall I go, O Lord? You have the words of eternal life. It's a turn to him. Right? Repent. The solution to compromise. Repent. Second part right here. Look at verse 24 to 27. So now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching, and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He, who, he will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery. Let me read verse 26 again. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end. I will give authority over the nations. This is an allusion to the story that Jesus told his disciples about the minas. So he gave to, um, to he told a story about a master giving a certain allotment to some of his servants. Here I give you ten. Here I give you five. Here I give you one. Master goes away for a while, comes back, asks the servant, "What have you done with the ten I've given you?" The servant says, "I've found ten more." Well done, my good and faithful servant. Here's ten cities for you to rule. Comes back to the five. Five, what have you done? I have gained five more. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Here's five more. Here's five cities for you to rule. Comes to the one servant. Here's the one. What have you done with the one thing I've given you? The one thing I've given you. I have done nothing, God, with it. I have done absolutely nothing with it. You wicked servant. Take that from him. Give to the one who has more. All right? 
What is Jesus saying? What is Jesus saying here? Right? How do we begin to overcome compromise? It's this. Do what he has called you to do. Those who will continue my will to the end. Those who will obey me to the end. To listen to what I have to tell you. Those who will, what I have given to you, obey me in that. If, if I have called you to be a father, then be, the, then be a faithful father to the end. If I have called you to be a leader of ministry, whatever ministry that is, whether it be your family ministry or church ministry, be faithful to it. Obey me to the end. If I have called you to be a husband, then be a husband to the end. If I called you to be a wife, then be a faithful wife to the end. Whatever I have given to you, obey me to the end of it. Yesterday we saw a video of your men's and women's group. It's a really great illustration that I really liked, that a lot of the guys also liked, was this idea of obedience, right? That Jesus says, this is what I'm calling you to do, obey me. And Francis Chan, the, the, the guy we were listening to, he said that it's like me telling my daughter, go clean your room. Daughter comes back and says, father, I've thought about cleaning my room, and it's so exciting. It's so great. I've thought about it, and it's going to be so great when I clean it. And the father asks, so have you cleaned it? No, but it's going to be so good when I do it. You know, it's so great. I've gathered with a bunch of people on Fridays to talk about what greatness it will be when my room is clean. The father asks, have you cleaned your room? No, but think about it. Wouldn't it be so awesome, the fact that we're talking about it, that that's going to be so good when the room gets clean? Yeah, but have you cleaned your room? No. Right? That's the problem. That's the problem. Jesus is saying, if you're going to do my will to the end, then have you done it? Have you done my will to the end? If I've called you to feed the homeless, have you fed the homeless? If I've called you to be head of house in your family, have you been head of house in your family? If I have called you to be a faithful wife in the family, have you been a faithful wife in your family? If I have called you to be faithful in your singleness, have you been faithful in your singleness? If I have called you to let go, have you let go? If I have called you to obey, have you obeyed? Have you obeyed? Don't talk about obedience. Don't talk about what it would be like to be such a godly woman or a godly man. Don't talk about what it would be like to be such a great godly community. Have you obeyed it? Have you done it? Have you followed my will to the end? The way we move away from compromise is direct obedience. See, the reason why we compromise in the first place is there is no obedience. We make excuses for obedience. We make excuses for what God tells us and calls us to do. We rationalize it and says, this probably doesn't pertain to me, right? It pertains to everybody else, but not to me. There's a reason why this is, doesn't fit for me. I know this is what God is saying, but there is no but when it comes to direct obedience, you guys. How do we move away from compromise it's to obey. Let me ask you that question. When God is speaking to your heart, and you know he has, and he asks you to obey in certain areas of your life, have you obeyed? Or have you compromised? Or have you merely tolerated? See, the danger of it is what? Today you're thinking, I'm, everything's fine. I still go to church, Tony. I still show up to community group. I still read my Bible. I still have my QTs. I still do my prayer. Everything is fine. I got this. Of course everything is fine today. Satan never attacks you in one day. The way you destroy something is you destroy it slowly over time. And when you do it, you destroy it completely. You destroy it completely when you do it that way. Satan doesn't want you to be destroyed one time and then have a chance for you to repent. He wants to destroy you in such a way that you cannot come back from it. That's what they want. He wants to eat you from the inside out, poison you in such a way where you cannot come back from it. So before you get there, will you repent and hear those who have hear ears, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to you. Those who have ears, listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you, and obey now. Obey today. 
Obey at this moment. Obey. Stop rationalizing it. Stop thinking that you are the one loophole. Stop thinking that out of all the people, somehow God will pass you up, that he will somehow not look to your disobedience and say, that's fine, I'll make an exception. Stop thinking that you're the exception. So many times people think that they're the exception to the rules. Obey. obey. Obedience, you guys. Right? But how do I do it, Tony? How do I do it? Honestly, it's hard. It's hard not to compromise. It's hard when everyone else around me is buying their houses, when everyone else around me is having a career. It's hard when everyone else around me is getting married and they look like they're all happy with their relationship. It's hard not to compromise. It's hard not to make excuses. It's hard not to, it's hard to obey in the midst of such burdens and such temptations. It's hard to do this. How am I supposed to have the strength and the power to do it? All right. Verse 28, he says this, I will also give him the morning star. I will give him the morning star. You know who the morning star is? It's Jesus. And you're thinking, okay, well, that's great. I have Jesus. That doesn't help. Okay, not right now at least, right? Let me explain something to you. The story with Elijah, when, when the kings in the Old Testament, when the kings mess up, when the priests messed up, God always has a self-correcting mechanism. I told you that last week. There's always a self-correcting mechanism in God's truth, right? He will always send someone to correct all the wrong. The last and final person he sends is the prophet. The prophet comes. He has no, no one can tie him down. He has no political connection. He has no political tie. His tie is to God alone. He comes in and he calls everybody out. So Elijah comes in when Ahab messed up and all the priests of God's kingdom messed up. Elijah walks in. He says this to Jezebel. Call out all your priests. We're going to have a showdown. Call out all the priests to your bells. Meet me at Mount Carmel. We will see who is the true God. And I will show my people who the true and living God is. I will show this disobedient nation who the true and living God is. And so they came to Mount Carmel, all 153 priests, not 53, 150-ish, I forgot the number, I'm sorry. Right? All priests of Baal came. Elijah said, this is the bet. Here's the offering. Here's the sacrifice. Whoever, whoever God comes and burns the sacrifice, that is the true and living God. Baal, you go first. All, all the priests, they dance around in circles, screaming and wailing, cutting themselves, asking for their God to come and burn their sacrifice. While all the people of Israel watch, waiting, thinking, hoping that their compromise was not in vain, watching to see if Baal would show up and burn the sacrifice. They wail for hours upon hours upon hours. Nothing happens. Finally, they gave up. Elijah steps up and he says this. He says, let's make it even harder. I'm going to prove this day, now and forever, that Yahweh God is the one true God of Israel. Four jugs of water. Pour it on the offering. Right? I mean, if it's hard to burn things already, put four water on top of it. Pour four huge jugs made a huge trench of water, covered his offering. And Elijah prays, O oh God, let them know this day and forevermore that you are the true and living God of Israel. Let your people know and return to you. And what happens? Fire comes down. See, God in his judgment should have done well with the fire. He should have burned all the people at that very moment. All the disobedient, all the compromises, all those who have given their lives to the hands of Baal, who have chosen to compromise their relationship and their walk with God, who have chosen to walk away from God. At that very moment, God's judgment comes in fire. Fire always, always represents judgment. It comes, it should have burned the people completely. That should have been where God should have directed his judgment. But you know where he directed his judgment instead? On the sacrifice. All the judgment that was meant to be for the people, God placed it upon the sacrifice, and he wiped it out completely. 
And when the people gaze upon the sacrifice of God and the offering of God and the judgment of God, they cried out, this is God. This is truly God. And what did Elijah do to the priests of Baal? He wiped them all out. For those who do not follow after the living God, the only end game for you is death. He wiped out, he purged Israel of this compromise. How do we have the power to obey? How do we have the power to follow? To realize that that fire of judgment should have fallen deep upon us. Should have fallen so righteously burning all of us up, but yet instead of directing it towards us, God directed it towards his sacrifice, Jesus Christ the Lamb. So that instead of getting the judgment of death, we receive the morning star of life. What does the morning star represent? It is the very beacon of the morning day. Life is coming. Life is here. It's a new day. It's a new dawn. It's a good life. The song just came to my head. I'm sorry. (laughs) It's a new day. Life is yours. Live in obedience. The people repented at that very moment. They cried out and they right their wrongs. They cast away their idols. They got rid of the priests of Baals. They tore down the altars and they worshiped God once again. God has called you guys and he asked you this question. I guess he asked the question to Church of Thyatira. Do you love me to not compromise your relationship with me? Do you love me enough to not tolerate the workings of whatever culture you're in and keep firm and steadfast to my truth, my word, and who I am. Do you understand that if you do, the danger behind it is not the fact that I'm so mad that you're not worshiping me. I'm mad at the fact that you're walking towards death and you don't even know it. In fact, I'm mad at the fact that you are poisoning and blackening your soul day after day, and you don't even realize it. Repent. Return to me. Obey what I have called you to do to the very end. And I promise you, you will receive life. Look to the morning star. It is the very promise that every time you see the morning star, it is the promise that life is yours. That instead of judgment, I have given you life. Instead of reckoning, I have given you everything. Sisters and brothers, do not compromise. I know I say that, and I know it's hard, but listen to me, do not compromise. Do not compromise in your relationships. Do not compromise in your financial matters. Do not compromise in your education. Do not compromise in your work. Do not compromise in your family. Do not compromise in your marriage. Do not compromise for the sake of your soul for the sake of what God has intended for you do not compromise let's pray let's come before the Father let's bow our heads and let's spend this time in just response and as I just as I lead you in this place can we spend some time in this just in repentance can, can we not move so deep into a place of our lives where we're so indifferent to God where we can't repent even, even then? But now that we're here in the place where we're just, where we're just compromising, and as God is sending us reasons and clues and truth to remind us to turn around, can we begin to say, God, I surrender. Lord, I, as difficult as it is for me to do it, Lord, I lay it down before you. As hard as it is for me to not feel like I have to cheat my way to the top, Lord, I will be honest with my integrity and my character. As hard as it is, Father God, for me to think about my relationship and what's right and wrong, Lord, help me to be real and honest about it. 
Can we come before the Father and can we begin to repent, guys? Can we begin to trust that God is a God that's for you, not against you? That this letter is to tell you, walk towards life and not death. Would you repent, church? Would you break with your heart broken for the fact that he would write this letter to you, imploring you, calling you, speaking to you, doing whatever it takes to ask you to call you to return home? Would you repent, church? And secondly, would you pray for this? Whatever it is that he's called you to obey, which you're being very disobedient about, Ask for the courage to obey. Ask for the courage to obey. And not just to think about obeying, but actually ask for the courage to step out of this place and actually do it. To do it. Not just talk about it, not just dream about it, not just hope for it, not just wish for it, but actually to do it. To obey. Until the end. Not just for a season, but until the end. So let's come before the Father, you guys. Let's respond in that way. Repent as God calls your heart. Seek to obey as he has called whatever it is into your heart. I know he has spoken to you. I know there's images that he's put into your mind. I know there are things that's just tugging at your heart that you're just so wrestling with God at this very moment for. Would you obey and ask for the courage to do so? Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Let's come before the Father. Let's pray together. So, Father God, my prayer for this church and for this body is that we spend our lives in repentance before you. We spend our lives, Father God, obeying your voice and your will. God, help us to stop making excuses. Help us, Father God, to stop being stagnant in our life. Help us to stop rationalizing conditions around us. Teach us, Father God, to trust. Trust no matter how difficult, how hard, how painful, to trust. To do it. Not just to talk about it. Not just to dream. Not just to hope. But to actually do it. So Lord, we lay down our hearts before you. We lay down our lives before you. That the church of fire terror, oh God, repent before you. May we show you that we love you, God. And we show you that there is no other God before you. And we show you, Father God, that we will not compromise your name for any other reason, for any anything out there. Oh Lord, speak. Holy Spirit, come, convict, move us. 
into action.